yeah, you are live yes hello my dear friends very very good afternoon welcome you all to the session on taxation strategy specifically for november 2023 examination and i'm sure for everyone we are audible can you just please confirm in the chat box that it's audible Yes, perfect. Thank you so very much. So guys, uh, first of all, welcome you all to the discussion on taxation strategy for November 2023 examination. First of all, you guys know very clearly that we are standing now in the month of August and we just have few days left for our examination and it is not even more than 75 days. And that is what we were calculating yesterday that it's less than 75 days what we have got for this particular exams coming up. And this attempt of November 2023 is basically the last attempt under old scheme. Now, students will generally have a perception that whenever it's a last attempt under old scheme, papers will come more easy, correction will be more easy. All this multiple thought process goes into student mind. But let me honestly tell you guys, there is nothing like that. The paper comes easy, correction will be more comfortable. Nothing like this will happen. Like how every attempt exam goes on in the same way, exam will go on for this attempt also. But of course, my dear friends, first and foremost, fundamental important point is that for this November 23 examination, the Finance Act that is applicable is Finance Act 2022. But of course, my dear friends, by any chance, if a student does not clear in November 22 and he ends up writing in May 23, he ends November 23, but he ends up writing in May 24, in that case, my dear friends, he will be required to study the Finance Act 2023. The reason being very clear that in which year you write the exam, that year Finance Act will not be applicable for exam. So when the writing exam in November 2023, my dear friends, Finance Act 23 is not applicable for exam, but instead Finance Act 22 will be applicable. That is why we generally keep saying always that for May and November, syllabus is same, but for November and May, syllabus is not same. The reason because amendments will come by virtue of Finance Act, my dear friends. Clear? So now let me share the screen and discuss something very important with you and post that any queries we have got, that also will answer, my dear friends. Just give me one second. Good. I hope uh, the screen is visible for everyone. Yes, fantastic. So friends, when you're writing exam in November 2023, my dear friends, the Finance Act applicable is straight away 2022. Now in this session, there could be some students who already wrote the exam in May, but somehow luck did not favor and they're writing exam in November again. And there could be some students in this session who are writing exam for the first time in November 23 attempt itself. Now for May 23, November 23, there is no syllabus difference for a simple reason because finance had to be the same. But of course for GST, few small, small amendments might come, which ICA has not yet notified. They will release a statutory update very, very soon and they'll notify the amendments for our syllabus. So now guys, for November 23 examination, my dear friends, I'll split this into two parts, wherein 60 marks is for your direct tax, 40 marks is for your GST. But for next May 24 onwards, they have clearly clarified that be it direct tax or indirect tax, the marks allocation is 50-50 marks. But for November 23 exam, it is not 50-50, it is 60 and 40. But first and foremost important point, my dear friends, which I generally observe that students tend to miss out. That is, my dear friends, when we know that 30% weightage is given to MCQs, my dear friends, in exam, what happens is that you get case study based MCQ. When I say case study based MCQ, they'll give one situation, they'll give one circumstance, and based on that circumstance, question will come in the examination. 
And what happens very clearly is that in this kind of case study based MCQ, they'll combine two, three multiple topics. For example, they might combine topics like clubbing of income, income from other sources, or they might combine topic like capital gains and income from other sources, or they might combine topic like PGBP and capital gains. So that is where they try to twist and play around with the case study based MCQ. And when it comes to GST, they will twist and play around with the concept of registration and composition scheme or registration and RCM concept, exemptions and RCM concept. So what they basically do is that they'll combine two, three interesting topics and they'll ask it as a part of a case study based MCQs. So basically they give a situation and circumstance where they'll ask four or five questions of two marks each, 10 marks will be that case study based MCQ based on situation, they will ask that. So it is important that students should have a complete clarity of thought and command on the subject so as to answer the case study based MCQ. And uh, in our videos, already we have got case study based MCQ. Even in free resources, we have placed some case study based MCQs. You can happily look at that, my dear friends. Clear? So now, coming back to our syllabus, my dear friends, if you look at this, <coughs> in income tax, we have got first topic the basic concepts. In this basic concept, my dear friends, there is a high probability that a question may come in the examination from the concept of surcharge or a question may come in the examination from the concept of a rebate. And now, my dear friends, one point which I want to highlight and tell you very clearly is that under optional tax regime section 115 BAC, what your friends or juniors are studying for next May 24 examination is different compared to what you have already studied for November 23 examination. So kindly don't compare yourself, don't compare your preparation with May 24 exam students because for them, the new tax regime is totally, totally different. But for you, the new tax regime is totally different. So don't confuse yourself. Don't try to match their content with your content. I'm sure I'm very clear on this point. Good. Next, my dear friends, second topic we have got residential status and scope of total income. High probability that 99.99% one question will come in the examination from residential status and scope of total income, where they might especially combine the concept of 120 days and 365 days. That is your Indian citizen or a person of Indian origin coming to India for a visit during previous year. And there we have a concept of 120 days and 365 days concept coming into picture. If total income other than foreign source is more than 15 lakh rupees. Remember that concept, my dear friends. Other than that, there could also be a probability where one question can come in the examination where they might ask one kind of income they have shown. They will ask whether it is taxable for ROR, RNOR, NR. So that way a question may come in the examination. Very, very important discussion, my dear friends. Next, third topic, incomes which do not form part of total income, section 10 exemptions, my dear friends. Separate question may or may not come, especially separate question may come from one section known as section 10 AA exemption for unit setup in special economic zone. In fact, in last attempt in May 2023 attempt, a question has specifically come in the examination from section 10 AA exemption, with, with, which is with respect to unit setup in special economic zone, where we know that first five years we'll get 100% exemption, next five years 50%, last five years 50% based on amount transferred to SCZ reinvestment reserve account. Clear with that, my dear friends? Exactly. Now, coming to discussion on heads of income, my dear friends, it is a brutal fact to tell you that every head of income has its own importance. And there is a high probability that all heads of income may come in the examination. Something like a six marks question may come from salary, four marks question may come from house property, a 10 mark question can come from PGVP, and a four mark MCQ may come from capital gain, and a two to four mark question may come from income from other sources. So these five heads of income are those heads of income which cannot be ignored because any head of income may come in the examination which has got its own set of importance. You're getting my point? Now, when it comes to salaries, my dear friends, it is important that students should have a clarity of thought on what is the difference between allowance and perquisite and what is the tax statement for allowance and tax statement for perquisite. For a simple example, telephone allowance is fully taxable, but telephone perquisite is fully exempt. So students should have a clarity of thought on what is the difference between allowance and perquisite. One more example, children education allowance exemption is 100 per month per child maximum two children. But when it comes to children education perquisite, where education is given in employer's own 
school my dear friends up to 1000 per month per child it is exempt beyond 1000 per month per child is only taxable and there is no limit of number of children when it comes to 1000 and in salaries generally question keeps coming with respect to motor car also and i'm sure you guys know that in motor car the tax treatment of perquisite is based on three important parameters number one who owns the motor car number two who incurs the expenditure number three what is the purpose of usage of that car is it fully official or is it fully personal or is it partly official partly personal based on these important parameters we will take a decision as to what is the taxable percentage getting my point everybody exactly my dear friends moving ahead next topic that is about income from house property my dear friends in this particular topic what is required to be learned specifically is more about your pre-construction pre interest concept my dear friends normal problem i'm 100 sure you anyways do it that is your gav municipal tax nav 24a 24b all that you will anyways do it because that basic knowledge every student carries but the whole point is all about whenever a question comes to the examination on pre-construction period interest it is important that student answers that pre-construction interest concept very properly my dear friends that's very very important next topic that is your pgbp profits and gains from business or profession very 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 important discussion my dear friends without any second thought students should have a clarity of thought on what all are allowed what all are disallowed disallowances are starting from section 40 allowances are given from section 30 to 37 37 is general deduction 36 is other deduction and 30 to 35 we have got specific deductions and from 40 onwards we have got disallowances especially in cases where a tds is not done and payment is made to non-resident 100 percent is disallowed and a payment is made to a resident 30 percent is disallowed so clarity of thought on what are allowed what are not allowed is very very important my dear friends next topic income from capital gain my dear friends in income from capital gain students should have a great level of clarity of thought with respect to exemptions in capital gains that is with respect to section 54 54 f 54 ec and i'm sure you know what is 54 ec that is purchase of bonds of nhai recl pfcl irfcl where deduction is maximum 50 lakhs 54 ec is the only section where we have got limit of maximum 50 lakhs for claiming deduction and in capital gain students should also have a clarity of thought on section 50 c my dear friends that is with respect to stamp duty value in case of land and building that is in case of land and building if selling price is less than stamp duty value stamp duty value is deemed to be full value of consideration clear with that everybody so that clarity of thought is very much required in the capital gains topic my dear friends makes sense everyone exactly next income from other sources there you have got two three important topics my dear friends one is about taxability of deemed dividend second is about taxability of gift and i'm sure you guys know that there are five categories of gift number one sum of money number two movable property received without consideration number three movable property received for inadequate consideration number four immobile property received without consideration number five immobile property received for inadequate consideration and in every category of gift we have got a limit of 50,000. And we should know very clearly that movable property covers only shares and securities, jewelry, drawings, paintings, sculptures, archaeological collection, work of art, and bullion. That much is only covered in movable property. So if a car or bike is given as gift, it is not taxable because car or bike is not covered in definition of movable property. Make sense, right, everybody? All of us, my dear friends. And of course, my friends, in income from other sources, students should also have a clarity of thought, especially with respect to the concept of uh, what do you call uh, this casual incomes, winning from betting, gambling, lottery, crossword puzzles, where the tax rate is flat 30%, my dear friends. That clarity of thought is also required from income from other sources. See, the basic idea of this session is only to ensure that in every topic, what are the high probable conceptual questions which may come in the examination? And what all should be the focus areas from your preparation revision standpoint? I'm presuming that very clearly that you guys have already done your entire preparation and now you are in the revision mode because we are sitting in we are sitting in August, my dear friends, not in the month of June or July to tell that sir first 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 reading is only going on. No, it should be a stage where you are under revision status, my dear friends. 
Very clear, right? Exactly. Next, my dear friends, moving ahead with respect to chapter five. That is income of other person included in assessee's total income. That is basically your clubbing of income topic, my dear friends. Come on, what is the topic name, my dear friends? Clubbing of income. And in this topic of clubbing of income, 6412 is very important. 641A is very important. 642 is very important. And 6412 says remuneration of spouse from a concern in which other spouse has substantial interest shall be clapped in the hands of that spouse who has substantial interest. However, a clubbing provision will not apply in case where the income is earned out of own skill and talent. So friends, what is 6412? Remuneration of spouse from a concern in which other spouse has substantial interest. Shall we clap in the hands of that spouse who has substantial interest? However, clubbing provision will not apply in case where income is earned by way of own skill and talent. Next point, difference 641A. I'm sure you guys know 641A, which talks about the concept of clubbing of income of minor child, my dear friends where minor child income is clubbed in the hands of that parent whose our income is higher after all other clubbings are done. So basically we will finish all the clubbings and then check whose income is higher, whether father or mother. And then in the hands of that parent whose our income is higher, we will do the clubbing, my dear friends. And that parent, and that parent in whose hands income is clubbed will get exemption of amount clubbed or 1,500, whichever is lower as per section 1032. So the parent, <coughs> excuse me. So the parent in whose hands income is clubbed, so the parent in whose hands income is clubbed, that parent will get exemption of amount clubbed or 1,500, whichever is lower, my dear friends. And first of all, where do we club minor income, my dear friends? Minor income is clubbed in the hands of that parent whose our income is higher. After all, their clubbings are done. And that parent will get exemption of amount clubbed or 1,500, whichever is lower. Moving ahead, 64.2 says, in case of transfer of asset, in case of transfer of asset, by member to HUF, my dear friends, I repeat again, in case of transfer of asset by member to HUF, whatever income is arising, when I say transfer from member to HUF, it is transferred without adequate consideration. So if there is a transfer of asset by member to HUF without adequate consideration, then whatever income is arising, that will be clubbed in the hands of member, my dear friends. I hope you are getting clarity on this point, everybody. So in case of transfer of asset by member to HUF, whatever income is arising from that asset, my dear friends, shall be taxable in the hands of member because it is clubbed in the hands of member as per provisions of section 64.2, my dear friends. I hope this point makes sense for everybody. Exactly. Moving ahead, my dear friends, next topic, what you have got is, set off and carry forward of losses, wherein students should definitely have a clarity of thought on some important principles of set off and carry forward. That is, we cannot set off any loss with casual incomes. And if there's a loss from casual income, it can neither be set off nor be carry forward. And one more point is that if there is a loss from a house property, it can be set off with other income only to the extent of maximum two lakhs. And the balance, whatever is there, we will clearly carry forward. Next, if there is a speculation loss, my dear friends, we will set off only with speculation profit. Clear, my dear friends? Exactly. Next point. If there is a if there is a long-term capital loss, we will set off only with long-term capital gain. Short-term capital loss, we will set off with short-term capital gain. 
and the long term capital gain. So this clarity of thought on how do we do the set off is very much required, my dear friends. In the same lines, my dear friends, let me also tell you one point very clearly that how many years the losses can be carried forward. That is, my dear friends, it is four years in case of loss from the activity of owning and maintaining resources, speculation loss. These two cases, it is just four years, my dear friends. And eight years is allowed in case of business loss, capital losses, and also in case of loss from house property. And indefinite period is in case of unabsorbed depreciation and also in case of loss from specified business. And of course, my dear friends, one important point to be noted is that losses can be carried forward only and only if return of income is filed within the due date, except house property loss and unabsorbed depreciation. That means very clearly house property loss and unabsorbed depreciation can be carried forward even though return is filed after the due date. House property loss, unabsorbed depreciation can be carried forward even though return is filed when, my dear friends, after the due date. I hope we are fully clear with this point, my dear friends. Exactly, friends. Come on, let's get back. So I spoke about clubbing of income. Then I spoke about set off and carry forward of losses. And seventh chapter is, my dear friends, deduction from gross total income. And uh, generally, my dear friends, a separate question from deductions is generally what we don't see much. But there is a probability that question may come, especially from ATEEB, that is electric vehicle loan taken for purchase of electric vehicle. Or a question may come from ATG donations, my dear friends, or ATGGB company to political party, GGC other than company to political party. And ATC, I'm sure you know the concept of life insurance that if policy is taken before 1 2012, it is 20% of summer short. Or after 1 2012, it is 10% of summer short for the purpose of claiming deduction. Correct, my dear friends? Exactly, sir. And eighth chapter, my dear friends, is not a separate chapter as such. It is just computation of total income and tax payable. And there, there is a concept of AMT, alternate minimum tax. Basically, what, what we do there is we will take total income and we'll add back section 10 AA exemption. We'll add back 80 QQB, royalty on books. We'll add back 80 RRB, royalty on patents. We'll also add back 35 AD specified business as reduced by depreciation. The balance figure, what we get is adjusted total income. And on that adjusted total income, we will calculate tax at the rate of 18.5%. And if AMT is more than normal, we will end up paying AMT. And if AMT is less than normal, if AMT, what my dear friends, if AMT is more than normal, we will pay AMT and difference allowed as AMT credit. But if AMT is less than normal, we will pay normal, my dear friends. The whole logic is that name only says alternate minimum tax. In fact, in last attempt, a question has come in the examination where 10 AA SZ exhibition, they combine with the concept of AMT and ask in the exam, my dear friends. Make sense, everybody? Exactly. Next, advanced tax, TDS, TCS, a very, very, very important chapter. And in this particular topic, my dear friends, we really cannot tell which, which TDS provision may come in the examination because every provision is important. And every provision of TDS is important. And a student should have a clarity of thought on two, three important parameters. Parameter number one, when is the TDS provision applicable? Parameter number two, what is the limit in that TDS section? Parameter number three, what is the rate of TDS? These three things are important to be known in every TDS section, my dear friends. Especially you would have heard about something called 194O, some concept related to 50 lakhs, where you purchase goods for more than 50 lakhs. Then in that case, you have to do TDS at the rate of 0.1% which is applicable only when the buyer turnover is more than 10 crores, my dear friends. Remember this concept? And of course, we have got sections like 194H, commission, 194I, rent, 184J, professional, technical, royalty, non-compete fees, direct transaction other than salary, then 194A, interest other than interest on securities, 194C, payment to contractors or subcontractors. So like this, we have got so many provisions in TDS section, my dear friends. And let me tell you honestly, once again, that is in TDS, we really can't guess out which section of TDS will come in the examination. So every provision is important. So you, you would have already prepared the chart in the classroom. And that chart is what you have to go through as in terms of what is a TDS provision, when applicable, what is the limit, what is the rate. That clarity you should have, my dear friends. Next topic. Provisions for filing return of income and self-assessment. Return of income, a small question may come in the examination. 
especially from the topic of belated return or revised return or one latest concept known as updated return. We know this concept of updated return, right? After a time limit of belated return is over, we can file an updated return wherein we are required to pay additional late fees. We know the concept, right? Exactly, my dear friends. So there is a probability that a small question may come in the examination from filing of return of income. Or they might ask one, two marks, small question. When is PAN required to be quoted? Which case PAN quoting is required? Which case PAN quoting is not required? Or a question may come where they talk about linking of PAN with other. So like this, two, three important questions are there where probability of question coming in the examination is there. Clear? That's it, my dear friends. That is a discussion what I wanted to do with you guys, especially with respect to income tax, my dear friends, which is worth for about 60 marks, my dear friends. Now, let me talk about GST also with you. Yeah, online student is asking, sir, GST also, sir, please. Of course, my dear friend, GST also will talk. Don't worry. Yeah. First topic, my dear friends, GST in India, an introduction. Here, the probability of question coming in the exam where they might ask about what is dual GST model or where they might ask about Article 279A GST Council, where you would have heard very clearly that two third power is there, two third power is there with states, one third is there with the central government for the purpose of taking decision by the GST Council. Correct, my dear friends. They might ask a small question, what was, why was there a need to amend the constitution? The logic is very simple. Prior to GST law, there were taxes levied by center, there were taxes levied by state, but there was no tax levied by center and state together. And to give that dual power, there was a need to amend the constitution of India for the purpose of bringing GST into India. And very clearly, my dear friends, we know about definition of GST, where tax on supply of all goods or services or both, except alcohol liquor for human consumption. And there are five petroleum products which are temporarily kept outside GST. That is petroleum crude, high-speed diesel, motor spirit, natural gas, and aviation turbine fuel. These are the five petroleum products which have been temporarily kept outside GST, my dear friends. Next, chapter number two, supply, my dear friends. 99.99% a question will come in the examination where they might give some transaction and ask whether it is supply or not. Especially a question may come in the exam from schedule one, my dear friends. Schedule one talks about transactions regarded as supply, even though there is no consideration in which you have got four points. Number one, permanent transfer or disposal of business asset on which ITC is claimed. Number two, supply between distinct or related persons in the course of furtherance of business. Number three, transfer of goods from principal to agent or vice versa. Number four, import of services by a person from a related person or from any establishment outside India in the course of furtherance of business. Or there is a probability that question may come in the exam from schedule three, my dear friends, that is transaction which are neither regarded as supply of goods nor regarded as supply of service. That is service by court or tribunal, employee to employer, funeral, burial, crematorium, mortuary, including transportation of deceased, sale of land and building, except construction services, actionable claims other than betting, gambling, lottery. Getting my point, friends? Exactly. And there's a probability where a small question can come in the examination where they might ask about composite supply and big supply. And composite supply is that supply which is naturally abundant. And one of which is a principal supply. In that case, my dear friends, composite supply is taxable at the rate of principal supply. Whereas, my dear friends, mixed supply is that supply where two or more supplies are supplied together, but they are not naturally bundled. And there is no principal supply there. In that case, it is known as mixed supply. And mixed supply is taxable at highest rate, my dear friends. Next point. Next topic, my dear friends, charge of GST. The most important concept in charge of GST is your reverse charge mechanism and also the concept of <laughs> and also the concept of composition scheme, my dear friends. Section 10 composition scheme. Especially they might ask about section 10.1 or they might ask about section 10.2a. That is about 50 lakhs concept where we pay 3%, 3% scheme. That question also can come in the examination. And RCM, very, very important. Example, sponsorship service to body, corporate or firm. Recovery agent to the bank. Insurance agent to insurance company. Any point may come up in the exam with respect to RCM. Legal services to a business entity. Correct, friends? Yes. Next topic, this is one such topic where we really cannot tell what is important in this. Because in exam, my dear friends, they will give three to four points. 
quick and ask the exam that three to four points whether it is exempt or it is taxable but they will never give a question in the exam telling that 10 marks write 10 points of exemption they will not do that they will give three four points and ask whether it is exempt or taxable so you should have a clarity of thought on what are all list of exempted services do not mug up my dear friends just have a clarity so that when you see a point you should be able to identify whether it is exempt or taxable you do not mug up all the points as such the only knowledge required is that when you see a point you should be able to identify whether it is exempt or taxable that much knowledge is required that's it getting clarity everybody all of us my dear friends i'm sure we are clear till this point my friends everyone please reply once Yes, perfect. I was just waiting for a response. Done, my dear friends. Next topic, time of supply, value of supply. Time of supply, we have got section 12 in case of goods, section 13 in case of services. And it's very important to have a clarity, my dear friends. 101% a question will come in the examination. And especially, my dear friends, section 12, we know that 12.1 in case of goods, time of supply is always date of invoice. And date of invoice means actual date of invoice or last date when invoice is ought to have been issued under section 31 whichever is earlier correct my dear friends that is 12 2 general rule and 12 3 my dear friends rcm date of receipt of goods or date of payment or 31st day from date of invoice these three dates whichever is earlier will become time of supply and 12 4 12 5 12 6 same thing is there in 13 4 13 5 36 that is 12 4 13 4 is time of supply in case of vouchers if supply is identifiable date of issue of voucher Supply is not identifiable date of redemption of voucher. And 12.5.13.5 basically says if 12.2.3.4 is not applicable, then time of supply is a case where if it is required to file periodical return, then the due date on which return is to be filed. And if it is not required for periodical return, the date on which tax is paid. And 12.6, addition in value by way of interest late fees penalty. In that case, the date when addition in value is received which day it is received, that day itself will become time of supply. And in 13.2, my dear friends, the general rule says, if invoice is issued within 30 days from completion of service, then time of supply will be date of invoice or date of payment, whichever is earlier. And if invoice is not issued within 30 days, then time of supply will be date of completion of service or date of payment, whichever is earlier. Moving ahead, my dear friends, in the same lines, we have got section 13.3, my dear friends, Time of supply in case of services covered under RCM, like sponsorship surveys, legal surveys, director to body corporate, all these are covered in RCM list of services. And the time of supply is very clearly, my dear friends, number one, date of payment, number two, 61st day from date of invoice. These two dates, whichever is earlier, will become time of supply in case of services covered under RCM. Next, value of supply, of course, very, very important chapter. You just have to know about 15 to 15 3 that's it 15 2 is about what all inclusions we will do 15 to first point is any tax duty cess fee etc except gst charged by supplier from recipient 15 to b suppliers obligation in relation to supply met by recipient 15 to c all incidental expenses or anything charged by supplier from recipient 15 to d any interest late fee penalty charged by supplier from recipient 15 to e any subsidy linked to the price except subsidy from central government or state government that's it this all is what will add to the value of supply 15 3 is about exclusions in that we have got only two points my dear friends first one is discount required in the invoice 15 3 a discount required in the invoice 15 3 b my dear friends discount given after supply is made based on agreement existing at the time of supply so discount is given after supply is made based on agreement existing at the time of supply and the proportionate credit is reversed by the recipient in that case that discount is also reduced technically we call it as post supply discount next chapter my dear friends input tax credit very 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 important chapter 
where I question you come in the exam from section 16, where they might ask about conditions to be satisfied to claim input tax credit, or they might ask a question from 17.5 block credits, very, very important discussion. Or a question may come in the exam from section 18, which talks about new registration, voluntary registration, converting from composition to normal, exempt supply became taxable supply. How do we take the credit? That is availability of credit in special circumstances. Next topic, registration. One question can come in the examination where they will ask you to calculate aggregate turnover and also ask you whether he is liable for registration or not. That is why students should have a clarity of thought about 40 lakh, 20 lakh, 10 lakh discussion about Manipur, Mizoram, Nagaland, Tripura, and also about the concept of 40 lakhs, which is exclusively in case of goods. Other than Arunachal Pradesh, Meghalaya, Sikkim, Tripura. Correct, my dear friends. Arunachal Pradesh, Meghalaya, Sikkim, Uttarakhand, Puducherry, Telangana. There we have, we don't have limit of 40 lakhs. We have got limit of only 20, 20, 10. Correct? Yes. Next chapter number eight, my dear friends, tax invoice, credit note, debit note, and e-way bill. Generally, a small question keeps coming in the exam. What happens is that normally, when last question will be there in the paper, where they'll have option, either you write this or you write this. In that kind of question, they ask question from this, where they will ask contents of tax invoice, or where they will ask what is debit note, what is credit note, and when do you have to disclose the details of credit note, debit note. And of course, I'm sure you guys know that in GST law, credit note, debit note is different as compared to accounts. In accounts, we say for sales return, credit note, purchase return, debit note. But in GST, it's not like that. Credit note is given for reduction in tax. Debit note is given for increase in tax. We know that, right? Exactly. e bill is also an important discussion where a two marks question can come. Payment of tax may or may not come in the exam, my dear friends. But you should know about what is electronic credit ledger, what is electronic cash ledger. And what are the modes of deposit of money in electronic cash ledger? Especially, you should know about something called CPIN, CIN, Common Portal Identification Number, Chalan Identification Number. Having clarity of thought on those provisions is very, very important. Next, finally, the last topic of discussion is about returns, my dear friends. In returns, where a small question may come in the exam, where they might ask about what is the due date to file the return of GSTR 1, or they might ask about GSTR 3B or there is a high probability that they may ask question on QRMP scheme, which is nothing but your quarterly return and monthly payment scheme. Heard about this, right, my dear friends? Everybody, QRMP is basically stands for what? Quarterly return, monthly payment scheme, which is applicable only to that kind of persons whose aggregate turnover does not exceed five crores, where they will pay tax on a monthly basis, but they'll file the return on quarterly basis. You're getting my point, everybody? All of us, guys. Exactly. And in return, they might also ask one question on GSTR 10, which is nothing but final return. And GSTR 9, annual return. And friends, let me tell you very clearly that annual return is different. Final return is different. Annual return is required to be filed by every registered person whose aggregate turnover is more than two crores. But GSTR 10 is a final return, which is to be filed by only that person whose registration has been cancelled. And it is to be filed within three months of the date of cancellation or three months of the date of order of cancellation, whichever is later. That is GSTR 10. Getting clarity, guys? Exactly, my dear friends. The whole point of this particular video of discussion about potential strategy for... <coughs> November 23 examination is all because we have got less than 75 days to go for exam, my dear friends. And I wanted to have a quick round of discussion in terms of every topic. What is the importance given in every topic so that we have a complete clarity of thought on understanding very clearly which should be our clear cut focus areas during our revision, my dear friends. That is why I wanted to conduct this session so that we'll have a clarity, my dear friends. And very soon, I'll come up with more revision sessions so that we can revise once again, specific chapter-wise and topic-wise so that we are completely clear with that, my dear friends. And I'm pretty sure and confident that you guys enjoyed this discussion, especially with respect to preparation strategy in terms of what all should be the focus areas and which topic, which content should be specifically focused upon. 
and uh, if you have any query you can come into the chat box i'll be more than happy to answer your query my dear friends and any doubts anytime you have got we have got telegram channel and we have also got indigo on forums my dear friends on forums you can post your query we'll be more than happy to reply or even the youtube videos if you comment there also will reply my dear friends no problem you have got a lot of ways to reach out to us the whole point is that you have to study well and prepare well and for every support of yours i would be there with you for supporting my dear friends if it comes to tax shivadeja is absolutely there for your support to ensure that your taxation journey goes very very fantastic my dear friends because taxation is one of the very core paper at ca inter level because ca final the moment you enter your direct tax is there for 100 marks indirect tax is there for 100 marks that clearly shows the importance of this paper of taxation yeah some query what would be the probable weightage of theory questions in direct tax like explain list out uh, my dear friend let me tell you in case of uh, theory questions my dear friends generally a 2 to 4 marks question may come in the examination for theory questions my dear friends where it's not mandatory that they will ask theory questions but sometimes a theory question may might come maximum for about 4 to 6 marks my dear friends or max 8 marks not more than that so do not worry much that uh, big questions might come in the exam from theory my dear friends that will not happen don't worry yeah next any more queries indirect tax mcq so even in indirect tax also mcqs will come my dear friends because in 40 marks 30 percent that is 12 marks mcqs will come but what they do normally is that about uh, 12 marks is mcq right a six to seven mark they give it as a case study based mcq and four five mcqs they give it as an independent mcqs so when in indirect tax also case study mcq is high much very much possible my dear friends i already told you this point that especially they cover the topic of input tax credit registration composition scheme they combine or they might combine the concept of rcm and registration and ask clear good next somebody is asking how to reach out for queries i already told you that my dear friends in indigo land we have got forums on our portal any query you have got you can post on the forums my dear friends will be more than happy to reply on the forums that is specifically designed for forum resolving my dear friends for resolving the queries only we created that forums so any doubts you have got you can post in the forums any more queries thank you so much sir next thanks for the revision this will be really helpful during revision thank you sir kindly try to conduct session explaining a full ltp if possible i'll do that my dear friend once institute releases rtp we'll conduct a complete rtp discussion online live only i'll do that don't worry and we will share the link prior in advance so that will be easy for us to join Any more queries, guys? Looks like that's it. Okay, my dear friends, thank you so very much. Have a good revision, my dear friends. Any doubts, anytime, feel free to get back to us. When it comes to tax, Shiva Teja is always there for your support. When it comes to tax, be it direct tax or indirect tax, I will be there for your 100% support, my dear friends, to ensure that in tax, we score at least exemption, my dear friends. Thank you so much. Take care. See you all soon once again with one more interesting session, my dear friends. Bye-bye. Shiva Deja signing off. Thank you.